We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So, really quick review. If you remember, First and Second Samuel, originally one book in the Hebrew Bible, and they were later split into two separate books in the Greek translation of the Old Testament, which is called the what? The Septuagint, abbreviated LXX. And actually, they are a part of a four-part compendium of First and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings in the Septuagint. However, they are actually called in the Greek translation, First Kingdoms, Second Kingdoms, Third Kingdoms, Fourth Kingdoms. And it wasn't until later that they were uh, split up in such a way that you have the book of Samuel, First and Second Samuel, which is what the Hebrew Bible still says today. And then you have First and Second Kings, which is what our English Bible tells us. Now, it's also important to say, just by introduction, that Samuel probably wrote some of this. We saw that last week. There's no way he could have wrote the whole book. The book could not have been finished, completed until after the time of Solomon, because the book actually mentions in it that the kings of Judah, and remember, the nation doesn't split into Israel and Judah until after Solomon uh, and his, his son actually splits the kingdom. So probably it was written in segments. In fact, we left off last week saying there was probably three major stories and major segments to the book. So last time we said there was the story of the Ark of the Covenant, and that's the season of the judges themselves, all the way up through chapter 7. And then we talked about the story of King Saul and David, which finishes up what we have in our English Bible is 1 Samuel. And then 2 Samuel is all the story of the life of David. And so there's probably different authors for these sections. Samuel probably wrote the beginning of the book. He very possibly wrote some of the second section, but it's really impossible for him to have written all of the second section or the third because he would have been dead during those seasons. So we saw that it could have been the prophet Nathaniel or Gad the seer. There's, there was other options, but ultimately God gave us this book. Now, tonight I want to get into the theological themes of the book because number one, this book is all about preparing us for a king. So turn with me to 1 Samuel chapter 2. We are going to begin by seeing contrasting leaderships in the book. The book highlights some bad leaders to help us look forward to the leader God wants, a good leader. So 1 Samuel chapter 2 is where you want to go. And we start off in the beginning of the book. Samuel is not even conceived yet in chapter 1. His mother is at the tabernacle praying for a child. God graciously opens her womb, Hannah's womb. Samuel is born. He's dedicated to the Lord to live at the tabernacle in Israel. However, at the tabernacle um, is the high priest by the name of Eli. And Eli has sons. So now we begin to look at the first leader of the book, the priest of Israel, Eli, and his sons. Now someone, uh, if you'll, actually, if you'll just look with me at 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 12, notice what it says there. Chapter 2, 12, it says, the sons of Eli were what? They were worthless men, and they did not know Yahweh. Now, it's kind of a requirement, if you're a priest, to know the God that you're supposed to be a priest of, right? Um, one of the, the best theological and practical books you could ever read is a book by J.I. Packer called Knowing God. I really recommend every Christian to read it. It's a great book. Knowing God, J.I. Packer. Now, knowing God is fundamental to Christianity and true faith. But these guys, they're working at the temple. They're the son of the high priest. They do not know God. And the author is a little stronger than just saying they don't know God. What kind of men are they? They're worthless men. What do you think worthless men entails? Laziness comes to mind. There's a lot in the Bible about that. What else? Corrupt, sinful. Um, when you talk about worthless, you're talking about a lack of virtue, a lack of character, right? This is a, a very bad place to be. Do leaders need to have character and virtue? Do godly leaders need to have character and virtue? It kind of comes with the territory. If you want to be used by God, you've got to have these things. And that's a gift of the Holy Spirit. And the fact that they did not know Yahweh, to me, is the reason why they had no character and virtue. Now, it, it even gets a little tougher. The author of this book, um, maybe Samuel, remember he was a first-hand witness to this season, 
so he would definitely have been someone who could have wrote it, talks more about these men in verses 22 to 26. Look in your Bible, chapter 2, verses 22 to 26. Now we fast forward. It says, Eli was very old, and he kept hearing all that his sons were doing to all Israel, how they lay with the women who were serving at the entrance to the tent of meeting. What do we call that sin? Yeah, it's fornication, right? They were, they were possibly prostituting themselves. Or they're using their office as priests and the sons of the high priest to what? So we see this in religious movements all the time. The, the religious leaders use their status to do what? To be predators, right? This is predatory behavior. And um, which is why there should be safeguards in every church to, to have a safe environment where that kind of behavior is not acceptable, nor even possible, in my opinion. I'm thinking we should have, you know, a lot of people mocked uh, Vice President, former Vice President Mike Pence for the Billy Graham rule. You remember that? Or they called it the Pence rule because he would not, do, as a politician, do private reading, uh, meetings behind locked doors with women by himself as a Christian. Um, well, after the Me Too movement started exploding, no one was mocking him anymore, right? Kept him out of a lot of trouble as a governor and as a vice president later. So, you know, as Christians, we should be very wise. Now, Christians have different views on that particular application. I would say I'd always rather err on the side of caution than err on the side of danger. So um, in this case, yeah, that's what we read here. These men were using their status to be predators, which is just a vile thing. Keep reading, verse 23. He said to them, why do you do such things? I hear of your evil dealings from all these people. No, my sons, it is no good report that I hear the people of Yahweh spreading abroad. In other words, this isn't a hidden secret sin, right? This is what? It's in the open. It's public. All right? You're not fooling anybody. That's what he's saying as a father to sons. Now look at verse 25. If someone sins against a man, God will mediate for him. But if someone sins against Yahweh, who can intercede for him? But listen to this. They would not listen to the voice of their father. It was the will of the Lord to put them to death. Now, in contrast to that, the boy Samuel continued to grow in stature and in favor with Yahweh and also with man. That's pretty beautiful. So these guys are rebellious. There's a term that Moses used. Does anyone remember what it was when he talked about people that would not obey the Lord when God was merciful to them over and over? Stiff-necked. Stiff that's it. That's a great Old Testament word. All right. You want to really uh, get someone angry, just call them stiff-necked. They'll have no idea what that means. It's a good Bible word. They'll get the point after they think about the metaphor. Um, they are stiff-necked. They are hard-hearted, right? They are worthless men. They don't know the Lord. So they refused to honor their father, even in their last days and in his last days. And they rebel against God. Will God ever bless a church, a religious institution, a Christian whose life looks like this? It's impossible, right? They're not surrendered to the lordship of Christ. They're not surrendered to Yahweh as God. They're not serving Yahweh. They're serving their pleasures, their sensuality, their desires. And so because of that, they're going to die. They're going to die, not just, they're already dead spiritually, but they're also going to die physically. God's going to bring judgment on them. But notice in contrast to this, it says, the boy Samuel grew in stature and in favor with Yahweh and with man. Did you know there's a verse in the Gospel of Luke that says the same exact thing? Does anyone know who it says it about? Jesus. It says in Luke, Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and favor with God and man. That's, I have a sermon, the teenage years of Jesus. That's all we've got right there. Not the stories about him creating doves out of bread and all these apocryphal stories that people make up about. We don't have, know anything else about Jesus' Jesus's teenage years except for he grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. And that's all we need to know because that's all God chose to give us, which means he didn't sin. And as he grew and matured, he also grew in the way he served his father. That's a, that's a role model for teenagers, right? And that's what we see here. It's interesting that that language is paralleled here. Why is that interesting? Well, if you remember Hannah's prayer in chapter 1 of 1 Samuel, right? Hannah prays to God just beautifully. And then when God answers her, I'm going to give you a son, she gives him 
glory and praise. Really a beautiful prayer in chapter 1 of 1 Samuel, which we had time to read it right now. If you fast forward to the Gospel of Luke, you know what also is interesting? The prayer of Mary, which is so parallel to Hannah's prayer. So Hannah has this beautiful song in prayer in 1 Samuel 1. Mary has this beautiful song in prayer in Luke chapter 1. And 1 Samuel 2, Samuel grows in wisdom and stature in favor with God and man. In the beginning of Luke, Jesus grows in wisdom and stature in favor with God and man. Just a beautiful little parallel there I want to point out in these, in these sections. Now, the second leader we have is very contrasted, thankfully, to Eli and especially to Eli's sons. And that is the man Samuel. Now, Samuel is unique because he is a priest who serves in the tabernacle. That's a, a painting of him um, as a child with the, the aged Eli. But he also is a judge of Israel, and he founds a succession of prophets. So it's really cool. He's a prophet. He's a priest. He's a judge. Does that sound like anybody? Right? Sounds a little like Jesus. Okay. He's holding these three offices, but he still doesn't measure up to Jesus. He's not the Messiah. He's close, closer than we've seen so far, but we're going to see he's not the Messiah, and I'll point it out in a minute. So notice, first off, in chapter 2, verse 21, we read here, Indeed, Yahweh visited Hannah, and she conceived and bore three sons and two daughters. And the boy Samuel grew how? In the presence of the Lord. In the Hebrew, it's like in the face of the Lord. What does that mean, do you think? He grew in the presence of the Lord. What is that? A, it's kind of a metaphor. If he was in the face of the Lord... I mean, he wasn't literally in the presence of the Lord in the sense that um, bodily God was in the room with him. So what does that mean exactly as a metaphor? So yeah, he, he was delighting in the Lord for sure, and God was delighting on him. He was growing in his faith, definitely a part of it. What is this? So we haven't gotten to the Psalms yet and haven't talked about poetry. This is a very poetic, metaphorical type of statement. So when we read something like this, that Samuel grew in the presence of the Lord, it's a reminder that he walked in awareness of God's presence wherever he went. What did Jesus promise his people? He said, where two or three are gathered in my name, what? I'm in the midst of you. He said, Matthew 28, the Great Commission, I will be with you always to the end of the age. Same thing in the Old Testament, the covenants of the Old Testament. God said, I will be your God, you will be my people. I, Joshua 1.9 started... I will never leave you nor forsake you. This has always been a hallmark of people in the covenant of God. And this is just a beautiful expression of that. Later in chapter 2, verse 26, we already saw this, right? He grew in stature and favor with Yahweh and man. And then lastly, um, in chapter 2, verses 34 and 35, notice what the author tells us. God speaks through a prophet that we don't know. A prophet comes to Eli and gives this prophecy. It's a very sad prophecy. Notice what it says. It will come upon your two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, and it will be a sign to you. Both of them shall die on the same day. And that's what happens. They're going to go into battle, and they're going to die in judgment. They take the Ark of the Covenant with them, and what happens to the Ark? It's taken captive away into the land of Philistia. If you remember last week, we saw they put it in the temple of Dagon. Remember that last week? And what happened to the, the idol? It came crashing down. The head was broken off. The hands were broken off. It was decapitated, um, powerless. But these two men would die. And then it continues on. I will raise up for my ha myself a faithful priest. He will do according to what is in my heart and in my mind. And I will build him a sure house, and he will go in and out before my anointed forever. Samuel is an amazing man of God. He's a great leader. Again, prophet, priest, judge. Pretty cool. But there's something about Samuel that doesn't meet, match up to Jesus. Well, there's a lot of things. Number one, he's not sinless. Okay, he's just a man. He's not the God man. But number two... Um, Moses told us that there was a Messiah prophet coming, and there was something unique about that prophet that would be distinct from all other prophets. I want you to tell, I don't have this on the screen, so turn to Deuteronomy chapter 18 for a minute, and I want you to see Deuteronomy 18, 15, and then we'll turn right back to Samuel. 
Now, we looked at this when we were in Deuteronomy, but that was quite a few weeks back, so I think it's worthy of reading again. The New Testament tells us this, this verse we're about to read is referring to Jesus Christ. Deuteronomy 18.15. So De Deuteronomy is the last book of what section of the Old Testament? The what? The Pentateuch or the Torah, right? Pentateuch, the five books in Greek. Torah, the law. Deuteronomy 18.15. It says here, Yahweh. I'll let you turn. I see some of you are still doing the flipping thing. All right. Yahweh, your God, will raise up for you a prophet. Now, our English Bibles capitalize the word P, but that's not the case in Hebrew, but I think it's a good translation. They will raise up for you a prophet from, like me, Moses says, from your midst, from your brethren. But notice what it says about him. Him shall you what? Him you'll listen to, you'll hear. According to all you desired of Yahweh your God in Horeb in the day of the assembly. You're going to listen to this prophet. Sadly, Israel does not listen to any of the prophets, do they? They reject the prophets over and over and over again. But there's going to come a prophet one day, and that's why it's capital P that they will listen to. That prophet is Jesus. His word is the word that the people of God listen to. Now, there is a difference between Eli, excuse me, between Samuel and Jesus. Turn back to 1 Samuel and now look at chapter 8, please. 1 Samuel chapter 8. Um, Eli's sons, Hophni and Phinehas, we saw they had bad character. They were worthless. They didn't know the Lord. They suffered judgment. Sadly, Samuel's sons do not walk in his path. We're going to see another defect here. Sons that don't follow after the Lord. Um, there was a, a statement that a, a very well-known pastor named Eugene Peterson made. And it applies to me as a pastor greatly, but it also applies to all of us in the room. And he said, if you succeed as a pastor, but you fail as a parent, you already failed as a pastor. Let me read it say that again. If you succeed, I have it on my desk. So if you succeed as a pastor, but you fail as a parent, you've already failed as a pastor. Now I could spin that around and say, if you succeed in your work and business and life, but you fail as a parent. You've already failed in your work and business and life. Okay? Um, that's your number one calling, your first calling, right? Everything else goes to the side. That's a very strong statement, especially for some of us who have children that are rebelling against God. However, there's two things to that point, okay? I know that's a rough statement sometimes, but there are two good things to that point. Number one, as long as your children are here, you have an opportunity, right? You don't have to leave it the way it is. Number two, God is sovereign. And he changes relationships that could be really bad. And he intervenes. One of the promises of the prophet Malachi about Jesus himself, we're not going to turn there, but if you just turn to the last book of the Old Testament, Malachi, at least in our English Bible, not in the Hebrew Bible. What's the last book of the Bible in the Hebrew Bible? Anyone remember? Torah, Nabim, Katuvim. What's the last book? Second Chronicles, okay? Second Chronicles. Remember when we looked at the canon? And we saw, I know the pop quiz, um, remember we saw uh, when Jesus talked about the martyrs, he said the first martyr was Abel in Genesis, the last martyr was Zechariah in Second Chronicles. And that's the order of the Hebrew Bible, so Torah, Navim, Katuvim. All right, way off subject. Last book of our English Bible, Malachi. This is a class, so I'm trying to keep reviewing stuff. Um, this is what Malachi the prophet says, through the Messiah... He will turn the hearts of the fathers to the sons and the hearts of the sons to the fathers. So if your kids are rebels right now, which some of us are struggling with that, know that it's not too late, right? That's what Jesus does. That's hopeful. So don't give up. Just because you messed up in the past, don't give up. Now, what you, what you can commend Eli for, we saw, is did Eli try to turn his kids at the end? He did. He did try. Now, sadly, we see Samuel's kids as well did not walk and follow after the Lord. And I want to say this as well. There is no promise in the Bible that says your kids will always obey just because you do the right thing. The Bible does say in Proverbs, which we haven't got to wisdom literature yet, train up a child in the way he should go. When he's old, he won't depart from it. We quote that a lot. That's a good passage. That does not say train up a child in the Lord and he will not depart from the Lord. It's not what it says. It's a proverb. But... There is promises where God, through the gospel, can do that, thankfully. 
All right? We have to do our part, but we let God do his part. Now, sadly, Samuel's sons, unlike Jesus, remember, Jesus is the prophet whose sons will obey, not Samuel's. Look what it says here, 1 Samuel 8. When Samuel became old, he made his son judges over Israel. The name of his firstborn son was Joel, and the name of his second son, Abijah. They were judges in the town of Beersheba. Sadly, his sons did not walk in his ways, but they turned aside after gain. They took bribes and what? Perverted justice. So what was their sin? If we were going to classify that, what is that? Well, they didn't obey their father, that's for sure. What else? The money was their God. Yeah, what did Jesus say in Matthew 6? No one can serve two masters. You cannot serve God and money. Can't do it. The love of money, Paul says, is what? The root of all kinds of evil, innumerable evils. And so sadly, these men, what was more important to them? Money than their faith. Now, the sons of Eli, what was more important to them? Fornication, sex, lust, pleasure than the Lord. These guys, now it does not say, by the way, that they were not believers. But it does say, uh, now we know the sons of Eli, they did not know the Lord. They did not know Yahweh. This tells us, though, they did not walk in his ways. They took bribes. They perverted justice. They were unjust judges, which America has a couple of those, too. So um, that's a big problem, isn't it, for the moral state of a nation? So you have uh, two contrasting leaderships, the judges, Eli, Samuel. Samuel's great, but he still fails. Eli fails terribly. He, he raises Samuel good, but he fails as a judge overall. And the Ark of the Covenant is taken from Israel. Then we move forward. Why do we need a king? We need a king because the judges aren't working. They're just not working. So, turn to 1 Samuel chapter 15. 1 Samuel chapter 15. The first king of Israel from the tribe of Benjamin is a man named Saul. Now again, how does judges end? With the tribe of Benjamin what? They're at civil war, right? Harboring wicked men, a wicked man. And, and a civil war. And so I think that that's put there at the end of the book of Judges to prepare us for Saul. Just like I said, at the end of the book of Judges is two terrible stories about Levites from Judah, which prepares us for Ruth, where we see a godly man of Judah rise up, Boaz, who's going to redeem the line of Judah to bring us David and later Jesus. Well, Judges ends with some wickedness in Benjamin. Saul's from Benjamin. It's showing us he's not supposed to be the king of Israel. So if you look at 1 Samuel 15, in the context here, um, Saul was in a war with Agag, the king of the Amalekites. He's the leader of God's people, and he does not wait for the prophet Samuel. He does not obey what God has said. So look at what it says here. This is a great lesson for all of us. Samuel says to Saul, has Yahweh as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of Yahweh. Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to listen than the fat of rams. For rebellion is like the sin of divination, or some translations read here, witchcraft. And presumption is like iniquity and idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of Yahweh, he has rejected you from being king. So Israel, sadly, gets their first king they want. They don't listen to the judges. They reject Samuel. They get a king. He does not obey. He doesn't wait on the Lord. And, and there's really important. To obey is better than to sacrifice. It's better to obey than show up on Sunday morning and put a show on. It's better to obey on Monday. Okay, that's the point. That, that's very simple, right? It's better to obey than to give more than 10% of your income. Okay? God would rather have you give 10% and, and obey than give 30% and disobey. Or some crazy number like that. Okay? Um, it is better, right, to obey God in the little things than to try to uh, do great extravagant things. The El Moody said... Most people want to do great things for God. Few want to do little. One of my favorite pictures, it's a picture of a guy with folding chairs. 
And he says, you're called to ministry. You won't even ha help stack chairs at church on Sunday. All right. But you think you're called to ministry? All right? If you can't stack a chair for Jesus, you probably can't do big things for Jesus. So um, that being the case here, you read this here. And then he says rebellion is like witchcraft. I mean, you're worshiping another God. This is idolatry. This is serious. So again, another failed leadership structure in Saul. Is he better than Eli's sons and better than Saul's, Samuel's sons? Maybe, but he still blows it. And then finally we get to the king. So if, if Saul is the abortive king that God's going to say, I'm not going to choose you and use your line, there is an approved king in David. So now turn to chapter 16, verse 7, one of the great verses in the Old Testament. 1 Samuel 16, verse 7. Notice here, uh, God has raised up Samuel now to pick out the true king of Israel. He goes to Bethlehem in the tribe of Judah. And now all of a sudden, we know why the book of Ruth's in the Bible. Because all of a sudden, we see here, Ruth was there. How did Ruth end? With a genealogy. Who's in that genealogy? Well, we have who? Who's in the genealogy at the end of Ruth? Who's that? No, no, that's that's a little that's a little too far forward. So the end of Ruth, right? Ruth and Boaz have a son, Obed. Obed has a son, Jesse. Jesse has a son, David. That's why Ruth comes before First Samuel. So you read that little genealogy, and if you're a Bible reader, then you get to First Samuel and say, "Oh." <laughs> Now I know why that genealogy, now I know why Ruth was there, because now we have just found that Jesse we were talking about. Now we're in the same city that Ruth was in, same exact city, and we're in the same family line. This is the great-great-grandson of Ruth, showing up here all of a sudden. Pretty cool, right? Passages are coming together, they're clicking together, you need to know the whole Testament. And it really helps you when you read Matthew chapter 1. And you find out that Jesus is a descendant of Obed, Jesse, Ruth, Boaz, and of course, he is a descendant of David. So here we are, 1 Samuel 16. Notice what the Lord says to Samuel. Samuel was trying to choose all of David's brothers to be the king of Israel. By appearance, they all look like great warriors, handsome, etc. But what does God say? Yahweh said to Samuel... Do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. Now, that's encouraging to me right now, because I haven't had my stature checked for a while, and I went to the doctor, and they checked my height, and I lost an inch over all these years. It's like, that's not supposed to happen. All right? Don't look on their stature. The Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance but Yahweh looks where? He looks on the heart. So David is going to be chosen because of his heart. And so now we are finding out why is First and Second Samuel here? It's here to give us the king after God's own heart, David. Where Eli failed and Samuel failed, David is going to be chosen by God to bring about the coming of Jesus. Very important. Now, there's a few other thematic things I want to point out about Samuel, the book of Samuel. First off, we find the first use of the word Mashiach, which is the Hebrew word for our English word Messiah, okay, Jesus the Messiah. Now, most of you here know this, but if you don't, I'll tell you. In the New Testament, Jesus has, is called by two words. What are the two words? One's a name, one's a title. What are they? Jesus Christ, right? Christ is not Jesus' last name. If you haven't, some of you have heard me say this way too much. All right? Mary Christ and Joseph Christ didn't have little baby Jesus Christ. Christ is a title. It's the Greek word Christos. It means Messiah or anointed one, the anointed one. All right, what does it mean, an anointed one? Well, Samuel, you're going to be the prophet of Israel. You're anointed a prophet. Saul, you're going to be the king of Israel. You're anointed the king. David, you're going to be the king of Israel. You're anointed to be the king of Israel. Jesus, you're the Messiah. You're going to go down into the water and be baptized. 
And when you come up out of the water, the Holy Spirit of God is going to come down on you like a dove and anoint you to show everybody you are prophet, priest, and king. You are the Messiah, the anointed one, okay? So when you read this here, you're going to notice that throughout the book of 1 Samuel, we have the word Mashiach. Notice here, the Lord will, Yahweh will judge the ends of the earth. He will give strength to his king and exalt the horn of his Mashiach, his anointed one. So now we're starting to see this concept of the anointed one, the anointed one. Now, we also learn that the king and the Messiah will be a shepherd. So it's kind of interesting. The prophet, uh, or excuse me, the gospel writer, Matthew, when he's talking about the birth of Jesus, he quotes Micah 5. He says that Jesus will be born in Bethlehem. He says, you Bethlehem in the land of Judah, you are not the least among the rulers of Judah. For from you will come a ruler... But notice there's an expression here, who will shepherd my people Israel. The king is not simply an authoritarian. He's a shepherd. The Messiah is not simply a king authoritarian. He's a shepherd of the people of God. Um, we get this first here in 2 Samuel. We read about David. Notice this. In times past, 2 Samuel 5, when Saul was king over us, it was you who led us out and brought us in Israel. And Yahweh said to you, you shall be the shepherd of of my people Israel and the prince over Israel. What does Jesus say about himself in John chapter 10? I am the what? I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. This imagery of the anointed one and the shepherd of Israel begins here with the kings in 1 Samuel. All very important. Now, um, or, or the book of Samuel, I should say. Now, there's also a very important covenant in Samuel that you need to know. If you want to understand the Bible, you've got to know this covenant. Turn to 2 Samuel chapter 7, please. Turn to 2 Samuel chapter 7. So let's think about the covenants in the Bible very quickly in the Old Testament. What is the first covenant we said in the Old Testament? Does anyone remember? The Adamic covenant. God makes a covenant with Adam. All right? We call that the covenant of works. Be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, have dominion. Then the covenant of grace is the second commandment. Rather than killing Adam and Eve, he kills an animal and he puts animal skins on them and covers them and shows them grace. What's the next covenant? Genesis 9, the shedding of blood, the Noahic covenant. After that, what's the next covenant? You're on a roll. You're hot. Abrahamic covenant. Genesis 12 and 17 and 22. I'll bless those that bless you and curse those that curse you. In you all, the nations of the earth will be blessed. What's the next one? The Mosaic Covenant. Exodus chapter 20. The giving of the law. Right? God is progressively making covenants with his people. There might be another one in there somewhere that some theologians call the, the Land Covenant or the Palestinian Covenant. I think it's really a part of the Mosaic Covenant. And now we get to the next covenant. Very important. The Davidic Covenant. 2 Samuel 7, verses 12 through 17. And by the way, after this, the next covenant is the new covenant found in Jeremiah 31 and Ezekiel 36. You'll know all the covenants of the Bible by the end of this class, I promise, because I'm going to beat them into your head as we keep going. But 2 Samuel 7, verses 12 through 17. Notice what the Lord says to David. When your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up offspring after you who will come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. He will build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom. How long? Forever. Saul's kingdom was not forever. This kingdom will be forever. I will be to him a father. He will be to me a son. When he commits iniquity, I will discipline him with the rod of men, with the stripes of the sons of men. But my steadfast love will not depart from him, as I took it from Saul, whom I put away from before you. And your house and your kingdom will be made sure forever before me. Your throne will be established forever. He's trying to make something abundantly clear here. There's going to be a Davidic king who's going to rule forever. Right? Eternal kingship. In accordance with all these words, in accordance with this vision, Nathan spoke to David. So there are a lot of important things here in this covenant. First off, you see a great name for David in verse 13, okay? 
His name uh, will be known forever. It's interesting. What is Jesus called over and over as a title in the Gospels? The son of what? Son of David, right? Son of David. Secondly, he is going to provide a safe place for Israel. Remember, David is a warrior king. David conquers the Philistines, the enemy, all the enemies that Saul failed at conquering, that the, the Israelites, when they went into the land after Joshua died in Judges. Remember how the Judges begin. They did not run out the Canaanites. They still had Jebus, the city of Jebus, Jerusalem, right? What does David do? He takes Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. He takes the land. He defeats the enemies of God. And then you see promises after David's death. For instance, he will have uh, a house that will last forever, which is fulfilled in Solomon. The kings of Judah, we'll see when we get to 1st and 2nd Kings next week, that Israel splits into two nations. The north, Israel, the south, Judah. And then, of course, ultimately, is there any king in the nation of Israel today? There is not. But there is a king of Israel, and his name is Jesus. And he is ruling and reigning right now at the right hand of God. And one day he will come back and make all things right. He also promises a house for God. Do you see that in verse 13? A house for God. Now, how was this fulfilled? Well, yeah, who builds the temple? Solomon. It's a tabernacle during David's day, temple in Solomon's day. There's just one little problem. 586 BC, Babylonians marched into Jerusalem. What do they do? They destroy the temple. Then Nehemiah comes back, Ezra comes back, they rebuild the wall, they rebuild the temple. Herod makes it really beautiful. And then what happens in AD 70? The Romans come in, Titus burns Jerusalem to the ground. No temple. Wait a minute. Did God not keep his word? The New Testament tells us he did keep his word. Who's the temple now? The church, right? 1 Corinthians 6, 19, you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Uh, Romans 8, if you don't have the spirit of Jesus, you are not his. So preachers have often used the expression, ask Jesus into your heart. Now, I don't use that expression because it's not a biblical expression. Nowhere does the Bible say to ask Jesus in your heart. It says surrender to him as Lord, repent and believe the gospel. But I get the idea. There is a sense in which, yes, Jesus now is with you. His presence is with you. He doesn't just enter your old heart, though. He gives you a brand new heart. Total forgiveness changes your life forever. You're now his child, forgiven, saved. He's your Lord. That's how this promise is fulfilled. Jesus is ruling and reigning now as king. He's ruling in our hearts. Remember, what is the Lord's prayer? Your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. And he's ruling. In, he's a, we are his temple. We are the temple of God. Now, um, I like what one writer, uh, Kael and Delzich, who are German commentators, have said. The posterity of David could only last forever by running out in a person who lives forever. Okay? The kings that were descendants of David come and go. Come and go. Some pretty cool ones or some pretty bad ones. But they come and go. Come and go. The only way this promise can happen is you need a descendant who lives forever. By culminating in the Messiah who lives forever and of whose kingdom there is no end. Very important. So when you read Samuel, it's all about king. Even though this is not the book of Kings, remember in the Septuagint, it's first and second kingdom. In our English Bible, we call it first and second Samuel. But the word king is the leading word. The word king is used 350 times in first and second Samuel. That's a lot to use one word. 350 times. Now, this kingship is a fulfillment of the earlier covenants. One thing to, to realize when you read the Bible all the covenants of God just build off each other. They're all really one covenant. I actually argue that all the covenants, and we'll talk about this more when we get to the new covenant, are based off of an eternal covenant, a covenant before the foundation of the world. They're all based off one covenant, and they're all just really the outworking of that one covenant. Save that thought for later. But just to show you an evidence of this, if you go back to Genesis 16 with Abraham, God says, Yahweh says to him, no longer will your name be called Abram. Your name will be Abraham. I have made you the father of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful. I will make you into nations. And notice what it says next. And kings will come from you. See that? Already we have expectation of a king coming from Abraham. Uh, what king? David. What king? 
Solomon, what king? Jesus. And I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offspring after you. That sounds identical to uh, what we just read, doesn't it? Um, I mean, that's exactly what God said to David. He said that, uh, let's see here, your house and your kingdom will be made sure forever before me. Your throne will be established forever. Same exact covenant. It's just being passed down to the next generation. Reconfirmed, recovenanted. It's the same words. That's pretty cool. God is working through history. If you remember way back in Genesis, I don't know how many weeks back that was, seven, eight weeks back, um, in Genesis 49, God made a promise that the king of Israel, the, the scepter will not depart from what tribe? What tribe? Judah, which is where David, Jesse, Obed, uh, Ruth, um, Boaz, and of course Jesus are from. So very important here to realize that. Secondly, I want to talk about the problem of... Uh, the, the, the choosing of a king. Now, most people, so you've got judges, you've got Eli, then you've got Samuel judging the nation, then you've got his sons failing at judging the nation, and um, they are requesting a king because Samuel's sons are not following the Lord. And the problem here is not that they ask for a king. The problem is they lack faith and the kind of king they want. Remember, the Old Testament Bible actually gave instructions in the law about having a king. Does anyone remember what the, the law of Moses said about kings? Anyone remember? We looked at it, but it's, it's been a while. So the, Moses said in Deuteronomy that if is, when Israel has a king, they should not multiply wives. They shouldn't oppress the people, take advantage of the people. They should be just, right? That sounds like a good ruler to me. If America get like one of those attributes in a politician, we'd be doing pretty good, right? Just one. We'll take one. We don't even need all three. That's a start. So that is what, um, you know, God had set up. Now notice what happens in 1 Samuel 8, 4 through 7. The elders of Israel gather together and they come to Samuel at Ramah. That's where he lives. And they say to him, behold, you're old and your sons are not walking in your ways. Appoint for us a king to judge us like all the nations. Right? They want to be like all the nations. That's your problem right there, isn't it? We want to be like everyone else. I want to have a... So in America, we have the same problem today. Well, we want to have a parliamentary system like England. Well, we want to have a system like the European Union. Right? Or today, some people are, are uh, you know, dancing with communism, fascism, socialism. We want to have a rule like X, Y, Z. That's the problem, right? Well, the thing displeased Samuel when they said, give us a king to judge us. Now, I can imagine there was some personal burn there, not because of his sons, but because he had been a good leader, right? But they weren't happy with him anymore, and he was getting old. They were ready to replace him. Out with the old dog, the wise, the wise man. We don't need him. We need hip, young, contemporary. That's what a lot of churches do. They say, out with the Bible teacher. We want the dramatist. We want, the communi we want a communicator who's going to bring in the crowds, okay? Um, we don't want the guy who's beating the law of God, the word of God, preaching the gospel of Christ. We want something else, an entertainer, someone who's going to make us more comfortable. So Samuel prayed to the Lord. Good idea, Samuel. Yahweh said to Samuel, obey the voice of the people and all that they say to you. They have not rejected you. They have rejected who? They've rejected me from being king over me. Now, they have not rejected Yahweh simply because they asked for a king. The whole Bible, remember, we just read all these promises. God promised a king was coming, a Messiah king was coming. But they rejected him in that they wanted a king like the nations. That's where the sin's at. They wanted a king like everyone else. They didn't want a king like the Lord. That was the problem. Now, um, there's so much more to say about these two books, but I've got to wrap it up. And I want to wrap it up with um, one last very controversial passage in the book of Samuel. So turn to 1 Samuel chapter 28. 1 Samuel chapter 28. I want to talk about the story of Saul and the witch of Endor. So remember, um, 1 Samuel deals exclusively with what? It deals with 
uh, Eli, Samuel, and the Ark of the Covenant in the first seven chapters. Then it deals with Saul and King David. And at the end of 1 Samuel, Saul dies. 2 Samuel picks up. David is now the uh, unchallenged king. And we have 2 Samuel's all about David's reign. So if you want to read about second, if you want to read about David's reign, read 2 Samuel. That's what it's all about. Now, there's a story here in 1 Samuel 28 that's very important. Now, Saul, when he was king of Israel, we read that he had put all of the witches out of the land, all right, which was a good thing. He outlawed divination, talking to spirits, necromancy, talking to the dead, all right, which, by the way, I just want to say that there is a growing movement in the charismatic church today and what is called a new apostolic reformation of Pentecostal churches that are seeking to talk to the dead. Um, you've heard of Bethel Church, maybe, in California. There's a reason why we don't sing their music. Some of their music is on K-Love and very popular, but we will not sing it. And the reason why is they're musicians. They go and they lay on graves, and they communicate with the dead. And they try to get power and a glory cloud and an anointing from the dead. It's necromancy. It's satanic and evil, okay? And I, some of it... Yeah, you know, we could say they're just being theatrical. Some of it, they are consulting demonic spirits. And they're hearing voices. And it's, it's very wicked, okay? The Bible outlaws fortune-telling, astrology, Bethel, Bethel Church, yeah. Um, it outlaws all this kind of stuff. And they're, they're incorporating that. It's called syncretism. They're adding paganism to their Christianity and trying to mix it all together. Now... Saul had outlawed all that bit as he was supposed to. But when we get to 1 Samuel chapter 28, uh, Saul's at the end of his life. He's at the bottom of the bottoms. God's already said, I rejected you. You are not going to be my king. And uh, he is fearing death. And he can't go to the prophet Samuel anymore. Samuel has died. And so we read in 1 Samuel 28 that Saul chooses to secretly go to this witch in Endor. So I want to maybe just read a verse or two. We can't, we're out of time. I can't read the whole thing. But I want to explain what's going on as we close out. Because it's such a weird passage. So 28.3. Samuel had died. And all Israel lamented for him. And buried him in Ramah in his own city. And Saul had put the mediums and the spiritists out of the land. Then the Philistines gathered. gathered. Verse 5. Saul was saw the army of the Philistines, and he was afraid, and his heart trembled greatly. Saul inquired of the Lord. The Lord did not answer him, either by dreams or by the high priest plate of the Urim and the Thummim. So Saul said to his servants, notice this, when you don't have a real relationship with God, you will quickly find substitutes. It's not hard. Find me a, a woman who is a medium that I may go to her and inquire of her. The servant said, in fact, there is a woman who is a medium at Endor. Saul disguised himself. He put on other clothes so he doesn't look like the king. Two men went with him. He came to the woman at night and he said, please conduct a seance for me and bring up for me the one I shall name to you. The woman said to him, look, you know what Saul has done. He has cut off. That means killed all the mediums and spiritists from the land. Why do you lay a, a trap for my life to cause me to die? Saul swore to her by Yahweh, saying, As Yahweh lives, no punishment shall come upon you for this thing. Isn't it interesting that people who don't have a relationship with God love to use his name? <laughs> right? They, they know there's a God, whether they are walking with him or not. The woman said, Whom shall I bring up? And he said, Bring up Samuel for me. Everyone knows Samuel, the judge of Israel. When the woman saw Samuel... She cried out with a loud voice. We don't know if she was moving rocks or stones or cutting herself. I don't know that they were using crystal balls then. She looked into her, her glass. I don't know. We don't know what happened. But she screams out and says, Why have you deceived me? You are King Saul, a satanic or a supernatural by via God event happens here. And we have to determine what's going on. The king said to her, Do not be afraid. What do you see? 
The woman said, I saw a spirit ascending out of the earth. And he said to her, what is the form? She said, an old man coming up covered with a mantle. Saul perceived it was Samuel. Maybe he's having a vision of this right now. It's very spiritual. And he stooped with his face to the ground and bowed down, almost like in worship, which is, again, wrong. Samuel said to Saul, why have you disturbed me by bringing me up? Saul answered, I am deeply distressed, for the Philistines make war against me. God has departed from me and does not answer me, neither by prophets or dreams. So I have called you to reveal. Jump down to verse 18. Because, Samuel says, because you did not obey the voice of Yahweh, nor execute his fierce wrath upon Amalek, that was what we read earlier, therefore Yahweh has done this thing to you this day. Yahweh will also deliver Israel with you into the hand of the Philistines. Tomorrow you and your sons will be with me. The Lord will, be, the Lord will deliver the army of Israel into the hand of the Philistines. And Saul fell to the ground and was dreadfully afraid because of the words. So he is going to an evil necromancer, someone who seeks words from the dead, defying God, defying his word, false worship, false king, breaking the law of God recklessly, okay? By the way, no Christian should ever go to a spiritist, a palm reader, um, a fortune teller, should not, should not navigate astrology, trying to find your horoscope and your sign and your symbols and all this stuff. God speaks explicitly against these practices. Now, in Deuteronomy 18, the law makes it very clear. It says, there shall not be found among you anyone who burns his son or daughter as an offering. We talked about that, Baal worship, Asherah worship. Anyone who practices divination or tells fortunes or interprets omens or a sorcerer or a charmer or a medium or a necromancer or one who inquires of the dead. Whoever does these things is an abomination to the Lord. I would say we as Christians should have sensitive spirits to even like, you know, watch stuff about this. I mean, it should bother you a little bit to be in its presence. If I had time, I could tell you stories in my childhood with unsaved family members who used to play with Ouija boards and do seances. And uh, I was not a Christian, but I got out of there. It was dark and evil. I knew, I think God was very merciful to me even before becoming a believer to put that fear in me. So the question here, why, why is this in this, in the Bible? And what's going on? What's going on? With one minute. Um, what's going on? All right. What's going on is this. God is making it very clear. Saul and Benjamin is not the line of his king. And that kings who don't follow Yahweh will fail Yahweh. They will not be faithful and they will not rule Israel right. And it is better to trust in the Lord than to trust in men. That's number one, what's going on. We need a better king from Judah, a kingdom that will not end, one who will follow the law of God, whose sons will follow the law of God, who will hear his voice, like Deuteronomy 18 says. So some of the questions here are, number one, was this a demonic delusion? Does uh, only God have the power to predict the future, or can demons and Satan do this? Um, was this an evil spirit? Or was this God Almighty allowing Samuel to come back supernaturally? Because this woman looks pretty terrified, like she's never seen something like this happen before. All right, This is outside of her normal practice. It's clear that the spirit of Samuel appears to the witch and speaks, and what the, what the, the spirit of Samuel says happens. The, the medium is shocked. So what do we do with all this? In my opinion, this has to do with the wider context of Samuel. The story is an example of God bringing up from the dead, from Sheol, Samuel, and bringing down the living to the dead, Saul. So here's how I want to frame this. What did God say to Saul when he disobeyed in 1 Samuel 15? Rebellion is as the sin of what? Witchcraft. And arrogance like the evil of idolatry. Guess what? Saul didn't get the lesson. He's taking the king who rebels and bringing him down to death. And he's bringing the lowly prophet and, and raising him up. The fact that Saul went out to battle the next day and died proves the truth of Abraham, who said in Luke 16, even if they do, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced, even if someone what? Rises from the dead. They still won't repent and be convinced. 
So, what's going on here? Well, I think this is a fulfillment of how the book started. Look at 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 6. Last verse. 1 Samuel 2, 6. Last verse for the night. Good verse to meditate on before we go to bed. Remember, the writer here is telling a story, a big story. So this is Hannah's beautiful prayer after Samuel is born. Remember how I said Luke begins with Mary singing and praying? Samuel begins with Hannah singing and praying. Then Jesus grows in wisdom and stature. Samuel grows in wisdom and stature and favor. Look at the song here of Hannah in 1 Samuel 2.6. Yahweh kills and makes alive. He brings down to the grave and he brings up. I think what we're seeing at the end of Saul's life is a fulfillment of this whole song here. And I encourage you to read it later. And then it's fulfilled in a greater way through David and through Jesus. And so that's what's going on. Now, um, scholars have a lot of opinions on, is this God doing this or is this Satan doing this? My answer is probably yes. It is God doing it and it is Satan doing it. Because God ordains the ends, but he ordains the means to the ends. All right, God does not practice witchcraft and necromancy. He hates it. It's an abomination. But God can use the devil as a pawn to make his point. So I don't think you have to choose. I think God is sovereignly at work, and I think this is a demonic evil act. So last word. All right. Here's how the book is mapped out, and this is in your notes. Chapters 1 through 7, Samuel the last judge. Chapters 8 through 15, Saul the wrong king. Chapter 16 to 31, the fight between Saul and David. David, 2 Samuel, the whole book, 1 through 20. And then 21 is a closing thought of the editor, the final editor. If I was teaching this book, I'd break it up this way. I'd look at the life of Samuel with Eli. I'd look at the life of Saul as king. I'd look at Saul and David. Then I'd look, chapter 2 Samuel is all about David. And that's how I would break up this book. Let's close in prayer. Father in heaven, we've seen a lot of material tonight. I thank you for this class that comes here each week faithfully to learn from your word. May we take seriously the warnings we've heard, this important, important words from your scripture. And Lord God, I just pray that this story that we've just read would remind us of the importance and clarity of your word. And if you speak to the dead, you'll soon join the dead. But if we go to you, Christ, we find life, the good shepherd, the Messiah, the anointed one. Bless this class. Use us this week. And uh, give us strength as we uh, get through this week and come back on the Lord's Day on Sunday. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.